<coughs> Councillor Basquez, you want to do the blessing? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for everyone here. And we ask your blessings on all of our decisions that we make for our citizens of the Cherokee Nation. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. This is our June rules meeting. So at this time, uh, roll call, Shelley. Yes, sir. Joe Bird. Ani. Kanan Duncan. Ani. Keith Austin. Here. Arlie Buzzard. Here. Julia Coates. Sean Crittenden. Here. Joe Deere. Here. Mike Dobbins. Here. Rex Jordan. Daryl Legg. Here. Wes Nofire. Dora Petskowski. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Mary Bakershaw, E.O. Smith, yeah. Janice Taylor, yeah. Victoria Vasquez. Honey. We have a quorum. Okay. We have two uh, approval of minutes to address the May, 20, May the 17th and May 27th. If you've had time to look at those, I entertain a motion to approve. So moved. <clears throat> Got a motion to approve. Got a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed? Thank you. And reports? I'll well, have our marshal department come and give a report. I don't think Shannon Buell is with us today, but we have a really good substitution here that's on the A team. Um. I believe you have a copy of our report, and if there's any questions or anything that I can answer, I'd be happy to try it this time. Any questions for our marshal service? Do we have a, a, uh, a cross-deputization agreement with most every county in the 14 counties at this point? Yes, sir. With, with every county, we have one in place at this time. Okay. That's good. Yes, sir. We're, we're doing something right. Yes, sir. Okay, any more questions for our marshal? Yes, Councillor Peskowski. I have one. Yes, uh, Mary Baker Shaw. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, were we involved in the shooting yesterday? Uh, where we evidently did not hit the, the, the suspect? I wasn't involved. Uh, no, that, my, I'm sorry, my question was actually uh, did the uh, I mean, do we need target practice or something? I, I was just curious. It was on the news today. Ma'am, not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we haven't been involved in any shootings since um, it would have been Halloween of uh, 2019, I believe. Well, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know if you all get to practice or what's involved with the marshal service, if you all have a practice range. and I mean, I've never seen your facilities or uh, you all have never discussed them, I guess, with me per se. But uh, I was just wondering if we have these opportunities available to our, uh, our officers. Yes, ma'am. We're required, um, if you're on the special operations team, you're required quarterly to um, qualify. Uh, as far as the other marshals, we're, we're required biannually to, to qualify every year. Um, we're also mandated through CLEAT, which most of our officers are CLEAT certified, to uh, have a firearms training at least once a year that's reported to CLEAT. And well, we, I appreciate your I appreciate your answer. I know the McGirt decision has definitely changed and changed your all's department, and I just didn't know you know how qualified our people were. And I'm, I appreciate your answer. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, <clears throat> Councillor Shambo. Uh, just like to say thank you to you guys. I know that uh, your workload has increased drastically. I know you're taking tons of calls. You're having to do backlogs from people who have been in the pen, and, you know, you're trying to keep people safe by filing charges on them. Man, you guys have, have done a good job keeping up with it. Um, just to address uh, the, um, I guess, the training and the firearms deal, um, you know, I got to watch your uh, special operations team apprehend a murder suspect and um, watch them do entry. And um, I will say this. Um, if uh, I've, I've been in law enforcement for 33 years and I've seen a lot of people shoot, but you probably don't want our marshals shooting at you. I can, I can say that for a fact. 
because, um, and we won't get into particular, particular instances, but um, it hasn't turned out for the ones who have shot at us. So um, appreciate what you guys are doing. You're, you're really, uh, uh, you've been just head, you know, getting your head right in, your nose right in everything and hooking up, and um, we appreciate that as, as Cherokee citizens. We, you know, we're happy that you guys have stepped up. Thank you, Councilman, and we are very proud of our SWAT team. We think we have the best one in the, in the state for sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Councilor Duncan. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that. That's, uh, those of us who are in the 14 counties, we see it every day. Um, you guys, there's no question about your uh, qualifications. We're very, very appreciative of you. Um, we get to see every day here, here in the 14 counties where you guys are rescuing somebody or, or subduing somebody that, that needs to be subdued. So we ju I just want to say that as well after, after those comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Councilor Peskowski. Yes, um, this is under the emergency management, and it's showing developing plans to construct three new storm safe rooms for communities. Do you know the locations of those, or have we been already notified of those locations? Um, I'm not aware of the. I'm not aware of where they're going to be, but I will find out, and I will get them to you in an email uh, this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Yes, I've had the privilege of touring where you guys do your, your practice and firing range and, and taking a tour of your facilities. You know, we, we're really fortunate that we have the resources and materials and the training that we do have. I mean, we're really above and beyond most of the local law enforcement. They would like to have what we have. Yes, sir, and we're, we're grateful to this body for, for the for the funding that is provided to us that allows us to go ahead and do the things that we need to do to be above and beyond the local law enforcement in sure. the area. Okay. All right. We'll keep up the good work. Thank yes, you very good much. Councilor uh, EO here. Yes, sir. Uh, on those shelters, are you going to send that out to everybody where the location is going to be? Uh, if, if you would like, I'll send it out and uh, make sure that every council member gets a copy of the email. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> you bet. Just send it to Gail and she'll make sure we get it. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good report. Thank you. Office of the Attorney General, Sarah Hill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Happy birthday. Thank you. All right. Can't think of a better way to celebrate my birthday than with all the fine people that are gathered here today. <laughs> um, Thank you for that. I wanted to just, it's actually not as maybe as interesting as a report as I normally give, which is probably a good thing. Maybe this, uh, the sun has made people go outside and do things other than commit crimes, slow down just a little bit. Um, I wanted to first address um, a couple of election issues. I think that probably everyone here is aware. I know it was reported that the nation added um, some additional charges, um, false personation charges against someone who had originally been charged in an um, election fraud case. And so there were five additional charges added in that election fraud case. There was an arraignment. Uh, the defendant pled not guilty, and it's been reset for August. So we're continuing to pursue that case and have ad added some additional charges. Um, at-Large Tribal Council candidate Robin Mays filed an election challenge on July on June 14th of 2021, and the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court dismissed it as frivolous on June 21st. So that case has been dismissed. Um, to the update on tribal court cases and processes, um, I spoke at a meeting of the Federalist Society in Tulsa. They had, um, it's a, a lawyer's group, and they talk about different legal issues. This was the second time they had addressed the McGurr issue um, D.A. Kunzweiler from Tulsa County was there. Uh, the governor's advisor for Native American Affairs was there, Ryan Leonard. And then uh, former uh, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, Trent Shores, was there. And so we talked to a group of about probably 70, 75 attorneys just sort of catching up on McGirt and providing, and I tried to provide a tribal perspective to that panel since there were also some folks there expressing the governor's position and the state's position on it. So I tried to provide some counterbalance. And I know that... Uh, that Trent Shores did as well. Uh, during my last 
report, we had filed over 937 new criminal cases today. Um, we're in excess of uh, 1,110. Um, that we've filed, so at least we didn't double it. At least we're not at 1,800, so that seems like it's uh, beginning to maybe slow down just a bit. We do have 137 juvenile referrals. I reported in April we had 67, so that's still coming in at a very good clip. Um, fortunately, we've got two detention, juvenile detention contracts set up now, and we're seeking uh, to get a Group E, um, which is a group home that provides care, so it's less of a jail sort of situation than more of a group home setting for those offenders who need who can, who can step down into a care that focuses on treatment. So we're working on obtaining some level E group home contracts. Um, our juvenile justice division has set up has been working with Cherokee Nation divisions, and I'll just to sort of you can see how we're using the tribal resources that we have. So we've got the tribe. Um, has a truancy issues department and education. So our juvenile justice department works with our truancy division, um, vaping classes, because that's a fairly common criminal issue for ju juveniles, uh, making sure that they understand the danger that they're placing themselves in when they vape, tobacco classes through pub our public health departments. These are all being provided by other Cherokee Nation departments and divisions. And also a first offenses, first offenders equivalent uh, that human services is putting together to help those young people who are first offenders, get them back on, the, on track um, while they're, they still have those first offenses and not waiting until they've got multiple offenses. So we're also seeking to work with other community-wide groups in those areas of the reservation that the Cherokee Nation doesn't serve, doesn't have as many broad services. So we're continuing to work on expanding the amount that we have throughout the reservation. Um, the nation's also been uh, pushing out the draft MOA. We've got our very first people on the hook uh, Via in Oklahoma, Councilman Smith, uh, was the very first group to jump on board with the MOA, but there's been a lot of interest um, from a lot of different communities about the municipal MOA, so we expect to have a lot of those signed here in just in the next few weeks. Um, Chrissy is actually at the annual Oklahoma Chiefs of Police Conference in Shawnee right now, um, doing outreach and letting people know about the MOA and encouraging them to, to look at it. So we're hopeful that we'll have a, a lot of communities uh, very quickly. We have several new employees that started at the AG's office. Cindy Cunningham and Katina Drywater are two of our new attorneys. Um, we've also added a new employee at Juvenile Justice, uh, Jacqueline Lanier, and a new employee in the Criminal Division, um, at Addie, Abby Haddock. Um, she's a new clerk in our department. So we've actually, we have 40 employees at the Office of the Attorney General. That is, um, we've hired, by the end of July, we'll have had 28 of those people added in the last year. So we've more than doubled the size of our department. Just an update on some of the court cases, the appellate cases that are going on. And we filed two amicus briefs um, in the past month. So amicus briefs are sort of the court requests sometimes that the tribes give the, our opinion, our legal opinion on issues. So sometimes they ask us to file an amicus and sometimes we just think that they need our input. So we'll file an amicus brief if we, if we think there's something that they need to know. And we've been doing that cooperatively. We filed one brief with the Muscogee Nation. So we filed it together with the Muscogee Nation. So our legal departments still communicate routinely if there are legal issues that we know are gonna affect the reservations of the five tribes. And then we're working on another um, brief today that I think will be filed by four of the five tribes. So. Uh, there's still a lot of issues and a lot of cooperation going on between the five tribes. Um, we may not agree on everything, but when we have a common threat, the legal departments are quick to uh, jump together and, and work on these legal issues cooperatively. Um, and then finally, I was going to let you know that um, in the, U the UKB versus Bartow case has been settled and dismissed. Um, that was a case that the UKB filed um, against Judge Bartow for a decision in an adoption case. Um, the UKB alleged that the Cherokee Nation lacked jurisdiction over Indian children within our reservation because the Curtis Act abolished the Cherokee Nation's courts. Um, that's not the law. That's what the federal district court found that, that, that observed that in 1988, Congress repealed those provisions of the Curtis Act and ultimately dismissed the UKB's case. But they filed an appeal to the Tenth Circuit. Um, the UKB AG and I agreed that the U Cherokee Nation could exercise jurisdiction over Indian children on the Cherokee Nation's reservation consistent with our nation's laws, which have always required notice to the child's tribe. So um, the nation uh, agreed to do what I've already required to do by law, which is provide notice in the event that a child is eligible for UKB citizenship. Um, but most importantly, from my point of view, it, it put the court case to rest and the child's adoption is finalized and permanent. And getting that accomplished 
space for that uh, child and, and that child's family was to me the most important thing. So I'm pleased to report that that child's adoption is done and complete and that, that matter is concluded. So that's um, just the, the update of what we've been up to. Certainly we've, we've been busy and I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Any questions for our AG who's been really busy? It never sounds like that much until I have to say it all out loud to you, fine <laughs> yes. people. Yes, Councillor Legg. Uh, Sarah, we, uh, uh, are we going to be looking at uh, implementing drug court or community sentencing for adults or anything like that? Drug court has been an issue that I think there's a couple of different ways to do that. Setting up our own drug court is something that we're interested in doing and that there's grant funding available to do that. But on the time scale that it takes to set up a new court, it may not be super useful immediately. What we've been doing instead is working with the local existing drug courts, because there are a lot of Cherokees who are already in drug court. And rather than um, dismissing those cases, especially in those cases where people have made a lot of progress, and for those of you who don't know, a drug court, you can be sent, if you're a first offender who has a drug crime, a drug-related crime, and you go to a drug court, um, you go agree to seek treatment, you do the things at the, under the supervision of the court that the court asks you to do, you sort of graduate from the program, and you're able to move on and put that drug offense behind you, and it really focuses on treatment and rehabilitation. It's particularly, I think, it's a, most people agree it's a better process than just putting people in jail for such offenses. It, it provides a lot of value to Cherokee citizens. Um, but a lot of the state courts, the state drug courts have said, hey, we're willing to work with you guys. If the, we, we will continue to see them and, and check in on their progress here. If there's an issue, then it has to go to the tribal court and we'll just communicate with Judge Bartow or, or whoever the district judge is who handles those cases. And they're, they're happy to work with us on an MOA or an MOU type situation. We've had phone calls from the drug court saying, you know, hey, we, we think this system is working well and could you guys consider leaving them here? And I think that that's, that, it, that's proved to be a viable option for a lot of these folks. So we're still working through the details of that, but I think using the existing state, state drug courts, certainly in the short term, makes the most sense. Yes, Councillor Dobbins. <clears throat> Sir, on the election uh, infraction, potential infraction, can you tell us exactly where that case is and what kind of timeline is there for the resolution of that, of that case? Sure. So the case has been charged. So we filed an original complaint where we charged, or originally I think it was two counts of false personation and one count of election fraud. And then we've added five more counts of false personation to that. Um, the defendants come to court for her, the first appearance, her first appearance, and you just typically plead guilty or not guilty in that. And she has an attorney, and so she pleaded not guilty. And so then it's been set in August for disposition and that's where either a plea bargain of some kind will be worked out typically or it'll be set for jury trial. We have jury trials in July and then we shall have jury trials again in October. So if she requests a jury trial then it'll go to a jury trial. So we'll be handling all that internally then in our court system? Yes sir. All that? Okay. Yep. All right. Thank, thanks sir. <clears throat> Councilor Buzzer. to ask you some of these questions also. We had a uh, instance back, started in February the 8th of this last year, that a memo was sent out to one of our CCO organizations uh, telling them that uh, since they had a candidate on their board, that they would not be receiving any more funds until the election was over, which is, you know, I understand that. Uh, if the candidate would resign from that board, then they could go ahead and receive funds. Um, but they said this was policy, CCO policy. So what happened, this person sent a request, a FOIA request, back in April the 23rd to get the policy. Well, to this date, uh, there's no, been no policy presented or shown or given to this person that requested it. We also have about three, I think, three extensions on that. So I think the uh, policy is that they have 20 days to answer the first request. If it can't be done, they get a 10-day extension. Well, this is goes on now for like three different extensions on the thing. So it looks to me like there's not a policy. But can the person state, can a, can a director state a policy that's not, that, that's not there? 
And I think you would have to, I think the question is, is, is it a written policy yes. or is it a, an unwritten policy of the department? If it's an unwritten policy or if it's a, I mean, I think that's where, you know, there are certain situations that come up that maybe don't come up every day. They may not have a written policy about it, but there's been a decision made. And then that, if that's made by the executive director, I mean, that's, that's the decision that they've, that they've made. Um, I'm, if there's a written policy, I, I presume it would have been turned over to him yes, or her, whoever the requester yeah. was. If there's been, but there should have been something that came back, and I, I don't know anything about this particular circumstance, but there would have been something that came back to them saying, there are no records that, we, there's no records that we can find that, that meet your request. Something along those lines would have been said to indicate we don't have any written policy to that effect, and that, that would be that would be the answer. If there's no answer at all, and it's just a, and there have only been extensions and no answer, then it could be that there is a written policy, but they're having, or they believe there is, and they're still searching for it, um, trying trying to put their hands on it and haven't been able to locate it yet, and are searching the warehouse or doing some other process to try to locate the the, the written policy they believe they have. That would be my yeah. best guesstimate, not knowing okay. the facts. And I, don't, and I don't know if they was wording. I think it just said per policy, but uh, what it was is, uh, and I guess some people or some person thinks that uh, if this was a CCO board member, then we other have we have other candidates serving on other boards, and I don't know that policy was done across the board like that would have been fair. I think that was the reason for looking at those policies, but I guess. Uh, my problem is if uh, if a uh, director or a person puts these letters out, then he should have backup instead of. I don't know if there's. I, I don't guess I've heard of an unwritten policy. Well, I, I mean, I think it means a, a po in a legal sense. You know, typically policies and are put together. You know, under our APA, so it's put forward. This is our administrative rule. So there's very formal rulemaking that sets policy. Mm -hmm. This council sets policy when you put things in statute that say it's the policy of the Cherokee Nation. And then there's the day-to-day decision making of executive directors, where they say, "Hey, in this office, you know, everyone has to wear a collared shirt." Or I mean, so there's things that are very formal, formal rulemaking. And then there's very, and sometimes people, when they say policy, they they may. They mean lots of different things when they say that word. I guess is my point, Councilman. And I guess uh, I guess they probably feel like since this was a CCO organization that uh, they had other candidates serving on other boards that got money from the Cherokee Nation, but this particular organization was singled out. Right. And they wanted policies for that. And I think if we look at it from that point of view, there ought to be some written policies for those things to do. And I'll ask Gwen, you know, what the procedures is now. If we can't produce a policy, then we need to say we don't have a policy and then go from there. Yeah, and that's and there definitely should have been a response, either a negative yes. response to it saying we do not have any written policy that meets that request. In which case, you know, the question then would need to go to CCO, I think. You know, okay. under what basis was this decision made? Okay. I'll, uh, I'll ask Gwen those same questions. Uh, and she may have an answer for me of yeah, what she, the procedure is if we can't produce a policy. Yeah, what I mean, I, I do know that, you know, if there's uh, many people get letters that say there are there are no documents that are consistent, that, that we have been able to uncover that meet your request. And yeah. that it's just. And, and I think it was the consistency of, of following that particular policy with the other organization, like Boys and Girls Club. You know, we have we have candidates on those type of boards that that, that policy wasn't enforced there. So I think that's where the rub is. Right, their concern is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good question there. Uh, Councilor Deer. Hey, General. How are you? I'm great. Hey, first I want to say Katina Drywater, she's, she's a great asset for your group. i um, known her most of my life, so I just want to say that that's an awesome asset right there. Well, she never mentioned your name, so well, I don't we, know what well, that means Sometimes for you. we don't have to mention names. We <laughs> just sort of... In the Indian community, not everything needs to be up front. So, <laughs> she's um, been, she's been excellent. We're very happy to have Katina on. Board. Oh, yeah, she'll do very well. Um, second thing, City of Tulsa, we talked about the agreements. Have you guys made any headway with those guys? Uh, no. No, Councilman, we have I not. I figured, okay. And then with that case that you were talking about, I know it's going to be August 3rd. Will that affect the election or have any effect of something that comes out during that process with that person? I don't believe I said it was August 3rd. I actually don't know when it is in August. It might be the 3rd. Um, no, it won't have. I mean, it's a this this individual committed this crime and will have to answer answer for that crime in court. But it's not an allegation against a particular candidate, just against a volunteer 
in a campaign. Right. I just didn't know because sometimes those things release other information out and didn't know if it would have an effect or not. So just wondering since it's after that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. I mean, I, I think the... If there's no civil or no, I'm not making, there's no, the Cherokee Nation's case is purely a criminal case against the individual. Okay. I mean, will it affect, you know, the election? I can't answer that question, but I mm -hmm. do know that our focus is on purely making the criminal case in, in, against the, the defendant. All right. That's all I have. Okay. All right. Happy birthday. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Counselor Julia Coates. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to comment on a couple of things, actually, and the first one is going back to um, Councillor Legg's questions about the, um, the drug courts and so forth. This is something that I know is um, arising all over Indian America to take, um, to take on, you know, to take ownership of, of, uh, of these particular offenders. And, and I know that restorative justice has been sort of the approach that many of them have taken. Um, which involves uh, the community, which involves um, culture and tradition, um, and is really most interested in restoring uh, the individual to a state of well-being uh, once more. Um, I, I hear you saying that we're taking on, we're trying to create drug courts, but I, I um, hear talk of behavioral health and, you know, public health and so forth, and all of that is, is very well and good. Uh, it, it reflects uh, a very Western model uh, that is employed by the state, and not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with that, but I just wonder if you might anticipate that somewhere down the road, uh, we might be able to add our own community and cultural elements to this. And I remember asking about this some months ago when McGirt had just been decided and um, you were overwhelmed at that time and said, we can maybe think about restorative justice down the, a, a year from now. And I don't know that it's even been that long yet. I understand that this is a, you know, a, an expansive undertaking to, but I'm just asking, would you anticipate us heading in that direction as well as part of our, um, of our taking over of drug courts and, and this, this type of initiative? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do think that it has a place. I think the other thing that my, and, and this is probably not something I would have realized prior to having to deal with these issues so immersively as I have, but there, these are, the people that work at the AG's office are tribal citizens. The court is manned by Cherokee citizens. The juries will be full of Cherokee citizens. And it is a, a fundamentally, it may be a Western model, but it is a fundamentally Cherokee court um, from the prosecutor's office, you know, all the way to the jury trials. And so I think there is a very comprehensive Cherokee element. I don't have to make my case to a, a jury. I have to make my case to a Cherokee jury and convince them that this person committed this crime and they will know what the punishments will be on that end. So I do think that there, there is a cultural element that is that it, it exists and in, as part of our tribal justice system, um, even if we're following a Western model, just like our constitutional government, our first constitutional government still reflected our Cherokee values. That doesn't mean we can't do a better job or that we shouldn't look for opportunities to, to make restorative justice a priority. I think that we should. Um, but I also think that we have a fundamentally Cherokee tribal system here, and I think that that's um, I think that that's something that we should be proud of, and something that is easy to lose sight of, and not not something I probably would have thought as much about until we were doing this work. Well, I I would follow up that in you know tribal restorative justice, I think that the, the sensibilities of crime and punishment are not even you know juries. Etc. They're really looking at different models um, that don't get into that kind of adversarial blaming, punitive, you know, but, but really are uh, focused on restoration of the individual into a state of well-being and back into the community. And that, I think, involves working beyond the court system itself. It involves working with traditionalists and elders. It, it involves you know, ceremony or whatever, it, you know, other cultural traditions. And I, I just, you know, would really uh, encourage looking into um, sort of um, 
a shifted perspective away from uh, sort of the, the adversarial and punitive trial uh, models as being particularly relevant and particularly successful in the treatment of, of, of drug offenders in particular, as has been demonstrated by numerous tribal systems all across the country. My second comment is just about, um, I, I'm, and I know the AG's office doesn't really have anything to do with this, but the discussion of policy, I will say this in response to Councillor Buzzard's questions. Um, we have encountered this with the at-large organizations that are under CCO or are not under CCO uh, as well. We had a candidate in the at-large race who was using the name of the organization uh, that they belong to and getting endorsements from uh, the leadership of that organization as part of his campaign materials. And um, this is forbidden in the bylaws of most of the CCO at large organizations. And yet uh, this particular candidate and group was not challenged on this apparently because they are not officially under CCO, even though they receive a lot of um, support from the Cherokee Nation in the way that the recognized CCO organizations do. And so uh, it, there's just, there's an inconsistency uh, it seems to me across the board, I'm not advocating, you know, for uh, everybody having to come under CCO in order to receive Cherokee Nation support. But I do think when it comes to uh, the policies that they need to apply, be applied uh, consistent, consistently. Um, I, uh, I have urged the chief uh, to depoliticize the community work uh, because I feel that it has become politicized and uh, he has agreed with that, but I do think sometimes the memo hasn't gone out uh, necessarily to uh, to the department itself. So I, you know, I, I do encourage that consistency of policy and, and I would appreciate, you know, just that the AG's office at least kind of know uh, that, that there, there has been a problem of inconsistent application. Okay, thank you. Those are my remarks. Thank you. Okay, good remarks, good questions. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Sarah. You did a good job. <coughs> Kanan? <laughs> I want to spare everybody that by leaving quickly. <laughs> That's the best we could do. We had a couple bad notes hit, but we did all right. Thank you. All right, Miss Gwen Terrapin. Good Give afternoon. Us some news. It's good to see all of you on this hot day. Um, we have 13 for you requests, with one of them outstanding at this time. No GRAs, and everything's been updated on the website. Okay. You have your report, and this lady's doing a fine job by catching us up from years ago. We were really behind until you took over, Gwen. So, uh, Councilor Buzzer. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Gwen, you probably heard yes, the questions sir. I'd ask uh, the Attorney General. What, what, what is the policy? How long do we give the extensions, I guess my question would be, okay. before the we get an answer? The normal time is not only the third up to you know the first extension yes. with the ten days, uh -huh. um, and then normally if the department comes to me and says you know we have a lot of research that we need to do, then we'll do another ten days. We never go more than ten days at a time, and normally if we do a second one such as I've done in this case, yes. um, I will contact the department and say okay, this this person you know, really needs the information, we really need to give them a response and ask them if, you know, if there's no documents available, then send me something in writing that says that. If the documents are available, then we need to go ahead and provide a response to them. 
okay. know, just as soon as possible. So, so you do that after the second 10 day extension? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Because I know uh, the uh, memo went out on, uh, I think, February the 8th from the director. And I think they requested a FOIA on April 23rd. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at, so, so you'll be getting back to this person pretty quick. Yes. Like, sound to me the, like. the response is due on July the 6th. Okay. So, because okay. I just sent the second extension on the 21st. Okay. So it's due on July the 6th. Okay. And before that date next week, I will be getting in touch with that department. Okay. To find out if they do have the documents available or not. Okay. All right, and, and I just, uh, just for the other uh, council members, and I think uh, Councilor Coates said it really well a while ago about uh, having policy that uh, is consistent all over and not just this organization. Right. It's like uh, we're spending money to boys and girls clubs, we're spending mm -hmm. money to senior citizens, that people are a candidate for a uh, uh, tribal council position. So. Mm -hmm. It looked to me like it was unfair to just target one organization. So anyway, if you can find those policies, that would be great. If you can't, a response would be great. Okay. Thank you. I will let them know. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Any questions? Good report. Thank you. <clears throat> and, you know, council members, I think our policy is we don't allow any council member to spend any funds, do we, once... Once the the candidates have announced their 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 candidacy, is that correct? We don't allow that to have any kind of type of community means. I, I think, is that right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not for sure. I, th I think I think we do on that. Uh, what was happening is like in Cherokee County. You know, we have three council members here. And say, well, we will if if uh, Rex or you were running for office. And they were allowing me to spend in that what would keep your people from coming over to mine or you two coming over to that. I think that's the reason we implemented that policy. And I don't have that in front of me. But as far as council members, that's work. But in, in communities where if you're keeping funds from going to a pantry or organization now, we might have to look at those policies there. Uh, you don't want to keep a community from receiving their funds uh, in any way. I mean, that just my opinion. I mean, I don't think we got anything written down. Yes, Councilor Buzzer. Yes, and you're correct on what you just said, uh, Speaker, but I can I can tell you this. Uh, I I haven't had a community meeting for over a year now, and I've asked uh, for some stuff to give to some of my people in my district, and so I haven't been able to get those till after the runoff elections. So my people haven't haven't had a community meeting for all these months and they still can't have them but I'm not running for election somebody else is in another district so why should my people suffer because we're having an election because I'm not running so I have no I have no uh, way to communicate with people but I'm, I'm kept from getting any uh, uh, giveaways for my people so here it is August the 20 uh, July 24th is going to be an election so you know, my people have missed out for over a year of, of receiving any of those things that we normally give away. Uh, the other thing is, I can, uh, this, this is just an instance that this person was on a board and I had sent money to those organizations, a thousand dollars, and it was reported that this person said that she got the thousand dollars. Well, they didn't know where it came from. So, yeah, there's some problems that needs to be ironed out and some policies mm -hmm. that needs to be looked at. And, and while we're talking about that, you know, it's, it's like our own policy within this whole committee meetings is when we elect speakers of council and stuff like that, you take the first vote and the other people don't get considered. I know Councillor Dobbins had brought it up one time before when there were people that uh, were nominated for boards. You know, you take the first vote and the other people didn't get any consideration whatsoever. And so their policy needs to be done on a lot of these things. So. I don't know. That, that, I guess that's my speech for this. It's uh, getting to the end for me, but I just feel like those things need to be brought up now because I don't want to see the next committee or next council people go through things that we've gone through. Councilor Dobbin made a really good point at one point in time about how far, 
how fair elections were for these committees. So I just think that needs to be taken into consideration as we go forward. Thank you, sir. Okay. Councillor Peskowski. So in regards to doing stuff for your community, what I have done is um, I just pay for it out of my own pocket, and then I'll get reimbursed once the election cycle is complete. And okay. um, as far as the community groups, I think some of that is based on their own bylaws. Um, from my previous experience, I ran in 2015, did not win, but, no, I take that back. In 2019, I was on the board, and when I won, I just immediately resigned from that position. I, you know, I think that's what's ethical to do. That's all. Thank okay. You. So you just used your own funds. If you were going to have a community meeting, then you were reimbursed. Okay. All right. Councillor Julia Coates. Then we'll get to you, Sharon. We are Thanks. we're still in discussion I, here. Yeah, we are in discussion and I'm actually calling a point of order because we we are hearing reports yes. at this time from FOIA and GRA and to go into a discussion about policy around campaign is 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 out of order. And um, obviously, there's a lot of interest in this, and I would just suggest that we form, you know, some kind of a, or, or put it on the agenda for next month or whatever people want to do or form a, yeah. a work group, you know, to talk about policy. But we are out of order. Yeah. Well, Councilor, yeah, Councilor Buzzard had some good comments, so I thought uh, we can address it and uh, let him make his recommendations. But all right, let's get back to uh, Tax Commission. Sharon Swepson, you're up. Good afternoon. I believe you have my report. I'll try to address any questions you might have. I would like to point out, I know last month I told you we had an increase in our motor vehicle and it has continued to grow. Uh, through April year to date, it's showing about a 27% increase over this time last year. And um, I've looked at the preliminary May numbers and it is still continuing to grow. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. On the other side of retail sales, I mean, we're coming back, but we're still we're about half of what we would have been normally so wow. compared to the previous years and stuff so but we're we're getting there we're coming back good so. all right Councilor Jess Taylor uh, I have a couple of things first thing is the Katusa attack office what's up with that what's the status of that um, as far as I know that is still on hold correct Todd <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, Katusa Tag Office um, bids came back and they were nearly double uh, because of COVID yeah. expenses on construction dollars. So we're uh, we're punting, but we're trying to come up with solutions so we can get started within the next 30 to 60 days. Okay. So we, we have a plan moving forward, just trying to make sure we can get it done. Uh, legally oh I understand <laughs> yeah but yeah okay. it was uh, nearly double what we mm -hmm. anticipated okay uh, and lumber's coming down but steel is going up uh, in the month of June steel has gone up 70% so it's uh, so we're trying to strike the right balance but we are uh, coming up with an alternative way to to fund the project so okay. hopefully we'll have we will see some movement out there coming up in the, in the next 30 to 60 days all right thank you my second question, Sharon, is I had a constituent call me this week regarding um, what I would call inconsistent mask ordinance at one of the TAG offices. I did not ask him which one he went to, but this is what happened. Um, he's a big anti-masker. Anti uh, there was a sign on the door that said you needed it. He walked in without one, as he does everywhere he goes. Um, but he was allowed to sit in the waiting room without anyone um, discussing it with him. Then when he got ready to be waited on and went up to the plexiglass window, he was asked to put a, a mask on or leave, which he did. And um, he was not angry, but I feel like that should be dealt with at the door. Yes. Um, so I'm it just should be, and I'll, and I'll address it. I don't know since I don't know which office. I will just address it with all of the staff, 
they do as they call them in they try to call them and give them a few minutes heads up so they might be in the lobby for a few minutes but it should be addressed when they come through the door and sometimes that's a little difficult because we don't have door greeters so if they're waiting on a customer they're going to have to stop what they're doing and say please put your mask on but that's something that we need to do so i will address that i think it, since this has just drug on so long just a reminder mm -hmm. of what our position currently is yes. would would be appropriate yes thank you Yes, Councilor Leg. I believe that was at the Salisaw office, and the inconsistency was when he walked in, the TAG office had the policy for the mask, and then Career Services did not. And so he was, like, yes. infuriated because the TAG office was making him put a mask on, and he said, and everybody's just sitting around over here without a mask in the other office. And hmm. so okay. I, I just I said guess. everybody was, had the right to create their own policy on the mask. And, All right. If you want the tag, if you want to get a tag, was, put a mask on. I'm going to let Todd address that. So, yeah, show your card. I'm on my way to Salisol now. No. Um, Which office are you going to visit? Yeah, uh, both. Um, so, it, generally, we have a policy that goes across uh, the executive order that was signed when across all Cherokee Nation properties owned or operated, mm -hmm. which means facilities that we may lease, uh, but we operate, as well as the ones that we own. Um, we have uh, begun to st start to loosen some of the restrictions on masking uh, based on our numbers. However, uh, public health, earlier today, we're starting to see those numbers tick back up. So, we're watching that very closely. Um, but I will visit with our, our team to make sure that we're having consistent application across all of our systems. The only caveat that we're going to have associated with that is going to be our clinical operations. In a clinical setting, um, when you've got potentially uh, known sick people coming into a facility, we will have a, a little different masking policy and guidance in a healthcare facility as opposed to a general office or a tag office or career service office. So. I'll visit with our teams to make sure we're doing that consistently across the system. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Good comment there. I didn't realize we had that two two departments there. The we, we actually have that in two locations, at Salisaw and at Jay, where we share office with Career Services. And then, of course, at the Caduce office currently, then we share a building with the Visitor Center. So, mm -hmm. so we had two different policies there. That we were dealing with. Okay. Yeah, so. Yes, Councillor Smith. The, in the South Side office, oh, there's a wall there, and that's why the ones that are in career services are saying there was a wall divided there, and they didn't have theirs on. And but the men got very irate and just yeah. Anyway. But there's a wall. Yes. It's just that entrance there, but they do share the same building. <clears throat> so he got irate, huh? Yeah, we'll just tell him to cool off. All right, anybody else? Yes, Councilor Shambaugh. Just want to say thank you for answering your phone every single time I call you. I mean, it's uh, nice. Uh, I know you always do, but uh, and thank you for your help on that matter. You're very welcome. And I followed up on that, and um, I, just, I did not find anything. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sharon's always dependable. You know, she's almost got perfect attendance may be perfect of all the executive directors <laughs> so well, anyway all right good report have a good day and be safe thank you gaming commission janice purcell Good afternoon. I submitted my report, and there have been a few additions to that. Tomorrow we're having another commission meeting. It's going to be at the Hard Rock. We are having live and WebEx still in a blended fashion. Um, the live is limited capacity, um, so we've been doing that. And also uh, we have been developing some more ticks, tribal internal control system, and working diligently. Okay, sound like you've been busy. Any questions for our gaming commission? 
I asked you this some time ago, and you may know. Are they going to have the OIGA conference this year? I need to check on that. I think they're having it in the fall, but I will check. Okay. Yeah, get back with us on that. All right. Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Human Resources. Famous Atlanta Castile. Been with us for a while. Human Resources. Here's another lady. You call. She'll pick up the phone and give you an answer. You may not like it, but she will respond. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. I okay. try to pick it up every time. Yes. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, you have my report. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer those for you. Any questions for Lana? Yes, Councilor Buzzer. about the shots that's required everybody seems to be okay yeah. yes and I've been taking a lot of calls about the uh, the vaccine incentive everybody's been pleasant about it I've not had any problems I've helped several several of them through the system but no, no complaints and so how are we verifying the shots they give us their they have to attach their card to the portal yeah, um, some of them have sent them to me because they can't get them uploaded, but I help them through that, and then I delete their cards because I don't want them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, Councilor Nofire. <clears throat> uh, I've had a few employees call and stuff and discuss about being either reprimanded or, or um, brought up by either their boss or someone in their department about what they may have said on social media. Do we have a social media troll unit, I guess, that trolls social media for over our employees? I, I don't know. I, HR doesn't have anybody checking social media, but I couldn't tell you if there is somebody that watches it. Okay. I just was, just because they've been popping up and getting me questions, I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe Cherokee Nation <laughs> trolls their employees' Facebook. I, I, don't, I don't know, I said, but... It's worth asking the question. I know some of them, things have happened half hours, and they're being called out on it by their employer. So I said, well, let me find out if there's someone who looks over those, our, our employees. So appreciate it. Thank you, Speaker. Okay. Councilor Coates. Thank you. Hi, Elena. Hi. I, uh, I just, <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, I, uh, wanted to follow up and you may not remember my my sort of question suggestion because I made it before the pandemic I know and the re it was about um, talking with the the benefits people about um, possibly adding a um, sort of socially conscious um, portfolio to our stock or to our 401k options mm -hmm. And uh, the reason I was asking that was because in 2019, I saw that the um, socially conscious um, funds were outperforming the market by about double, uh, as in they were bringing back over 30% returns. And, uh, and then 2020 happened, and they continued to outperform, and they are continuing to outperform to this point in 2021. So they are, um, these are just really um, some stunning options. I can uh, tell you more about it offline, but, uh, but anyway, I just, I wanted to reiterate that again because um, we, we presently, to my knowledge, do not have that as an option for uh, the employee 401ks. And I think it would be a very beneficial thing to, to add uh, as a possibility for them. Okay, I will get back with our um, benefits manager, and I did ask about that, um, but I will get back with her and remind her of that. Okay. Are you good? Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes, Councillor Leg. Hi, Elena. Uh, has the process from uh, uh, date of application to hire uh, sped up any? Uh, no. 
Okay, so I'm going to be quite honest with you, no. <laughs> but we have just recently asked for a budget mod and did receive that. Uh -huh. And we are adding staff to our background area, which seems to be where we kind of bottleneck sometimes. And um, so we're looking forward to increasing our time to fill. Uh, so in the background area, are we using the same background uh, co company that C&E does? Because they can do a job fair, they can mouse swap somebody and start them the following Monday using, and you know, that's C&E, that, that's like big time to, if you got any kind of record there, you're, you're not even allowed basically on the premises to be an employee. Well, that would be the drug testing agency. No, not, not drug okay. testing. I'm talking a okay, background you, check. Okay, you said mouth swab. So I well, they, you they do it all okay. right there at the job okay. fair. And Our then they give them a start date the following week, and then they start them. Right. Well, unfortunately, about 70 to 75% of our employees are in youth-sensitive positions, which require an ex a more extensive background. Okay. Um, and we really shouldn't put anybody on the job until we have that background completed. And so that does take us quite some time because we have to contact tribal courts, city courts, um, state repositories, just several different places to uh -huh. check everybody's background. Okay. Um, so that, that is lengthy. And we are, we, I feel like we were understaffed, so we've got, We've got that remedied, um, okay. hopefully adding staff, which we have made selections um, and we're waiting for the background to come back. How fast on. do you all hire your own people? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so we can get them started. <laughs> so um, hopefully once we get the added staff, we can, we can be quicker at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, for your staff that you're wanting to hire, you may run that through the tribal council, see how that goes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Anybody else? Elena, you do a good job. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. You guys have a good afternoon. Okay. All right. Old business, none pending. Uh, rules committee, new business. Uh, all right. Uh, Councilor Duncan, would you take that first one? Yes, sir. This is a resolution establishing a memorial honoring the Cherokee speakers lost to the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, I'm glad to see you did this speaker it's pretty awesome and I put that in the form of a motion thank you yeah I talked to this over with the administration they thought it'd be a good idea so and we got a motion second in discussion if not all in favor signify by saying aye, aye. all opposed sponsors all right number two Councilor Shambaugh Yes, and I'd like to make a friendly to this resolution um, to replace it with this resolution you have on your desk in front of you. And basically what it does, it adds uh, municipal jails as well as county. We just didn't have municipal in there, and it just covers us on some municipal jails that we might want to use as we house our prisoners. Okay, and that really was the only change? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, you got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Councilor Deer. Have we got to look at an MOU for that or the MOA for that? It's actually there. Ha okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, Sarah. You want to answer that? I mean, I've got a email from Chrissy, but go ahead. Sorry, I never want to interrupt. But um, I think the question was: Is there an MOA attached to that? Is that the question? Or an MOA, MOU that you can email it just to look and see what it. So. Yeah, so it's the, it'll be a contract with the individual mm -hmm. jail, so with all the different individual jails. This would authorize us to enter into those, those mm -hmm. contracts with the jails. Okay. okay. You just really add more resources to what right. we already have. Yeah, okay. that's what I was just wanting to see. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the, the standard jail contracts that we've been entering into, and we're trying to get one agreement that would apply, that we could use across the reservation, so that would be uniform. And it yeah. would, all it would do, all this would do, would authorize us to enter into those contracts. I don't have a copy of a contract. I mean, you'll, you'll get copies of them, but all this would do would allow us to enter into those agreements and waive sovereign immunity just for the amount of money that we would owe the jail. So they would be able to, if the Cherokee Nation did not pay its bills, the jail would be able to sue us for the amount of money that we owed the jail it's very limited 
Yeah, because the reason why is like a lot of the jails have different services, you know, mental health and stuff like that. So that's what I was wanting to see if they were customized per the jail or are they just a general. It's going to be a universal. We're trying to move to a universal agreement. And most of the county jails and the municipal jails are really just holding facilities. They don't have a lot of the same kinds of programs and stuff that you'd find at like a, a, a prison. Okay, that's all. Are you good? I'm good. Okay, yeah. Councilor No Fire. <clears throat> Did you, uh, I guess, have you, have you already negotiated all the contracts with these, uh, these jails, or are you still working on the negotiations? On um, we, we think we've got an agreement that everyone will, that I may mean, not everyone will sign. Tulsa County is not going to sign it, so it's, but this is an agreement that we're going to put forward, and we believe that the majority of them will sign it, yes. Okay, perfect. I didn't know if that, I just didn't where it says, whereas the Cherokee Nation have, or the Attorney General have negotiated detention. I didn't know if it needed to be has. Because you're still negotiating, but if you've already, that's the, what you're putting forward, and that's what it is. Yeah, I, I think it just leaves it have. Yeah, I, th I think that, and there, this will sort of be our. If this is what this this works for, you know, 90% of the jails that we have dealt with, and if the other 5% want to get on board, this will be the agreement that we're going to put forward to them. Can we have the MOA attachment to look at before we get it to full rules? It, it's a contract, not oh, an contract, MOA. Right, MOA contract. Um, but yeah, I can send that to over to us. I think that's what Councilor Dewey. Yeah, I mean that. that's that's fine. Okay, perfect. Appreciate it. So you want this before the council meeting? Is that what you're saying? Well, just to have it looked at. Yeah, the contract sure. to look at it before the council for the full approval. We can do that. So, okay. Appreciate it. Yes, Councilor Buzzer. Uh, Sarah, does this agreement also go across state lines like McDonald County, Missouri, or into Arkansas Is it or Kansas? This would, this would be exclusively for, at least at this point, we're looking at this exclusively for Oklahoma jails. So we don't have any contracts with any out-of-state jails. And we don't have a, have not seen a need for one yet. I mean, it's not to say that we couldn't enter into agreements with them or use the same one. Well, I, I know there's a lot of uh, natives or Cherokees over in McDonald County in Missouri, which is just next door to us there in Delaware County, too. So yeah. I don't know if there's any need for it or not. Yeah, I don't, we haven't identified a need for that just okay. yet. I mean, if we if we did, if for some reason the local jail wouldn't take them and the one right over the state line would, I suppose we could we could cross that bridge when we get there. Yes, Councilor Shambaugh. And one other thing, this one other reason why this is very important, you know, we've contracted with counties and cities, but when you do, let's just call it a McGirt arrest, you just can't go to any jail and take that person they do have to have a contract with the Cherokee Nation before you can take them there uh, so that's important for the cities and, and the counties to know too who accepts McGirt prisoners otherwise you can't take them to those jails who don't so yeah, and we've been had good discussions with the district attorneys and with the local law enforcement they're all they're all pleased with the draft contract and I mean we've really we were able to sit down with it. Tulsa County, you know, accepted. We've been able to sit down and work co co cooperatively and collaboratively with the local law enforcement and the local DAs. Okay, we good? Okay, Councilor Critton. Yeah, I was just going to, this is a little bit off, off target, not much, but just uh, if you guys get some of these calls, I might be the only one who didn't know this, but Officer or Marshal Buell enlightened me. I had a guy gets stopped at the municipality and the officer um, gave him a ticket and had one one cost uh, or one fine marked out and then it was a higher one and uh, so I thought hmm, that wasn't right but it was right and Marshal Buell explained that to me and it made perfect sense then I explained it to the person that got the ticket but just in case you might already know this but just in case you run into it they and Mike you can help me here the bond schedule for every municipality may be different and to keep to keep everybody from going hey Van, what's yours what about they they're just going off of the state is that right Mike the state bond by the Cherokee Nation bonds right but we did nope. we follow Kind of the, it'd be we, the same we have adopted as a state but, trooper, right? but no, I believe we have our own bond schedule. Isn't that correct? That's that's correct. I mean, it's similar to the states, but we have the Cherokee Nation bond schedule. Maybe right. I'm not saying it right, but yeah, like the tickets that we write. Like if a state trooper, you're right, writes me a ticket. That's that's going to be. It all goes. It all goes back to Cherokee Nation bond. If it's a Cherokee Nation citizen, it's a, that charge is a Cherokee Nation 
goes by the Cherokee Nation bond. If the city of Jay writes it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't go by theirs. It goes by Cherokee Nations. Okay. So each municipality, like he was explaining. And they are all different. And that's yes. a problem that we are probably going to look at your bond schedule and maybe just try to adopt it so mm -hmm. it'll be yeah. uniform. Just a Cherokee Nation? Yes. Yeah. Well, I thought I learned something. I guess I had to wait till the day to learn it. But, but it was interesting <laughs> anyway. It was really interesting and, and uh, made a lot of sense. So that's a roundabout way to say... Thank you and the marshals for always answering those uh, calls that we get because um, it, to me, changes every day, and I'm sure you guys, it changes every day. It uh, is complex, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to answer questions from any of you that, right. that have questions from I explain it to you guys the best that I can, and then hopefully you can explain mm -hmm. it to your constituents the yeah. best that you can, and eventually we'll get the information filtered out. Yeah, sorry to run that rabbit, but. You're good. That was a good one. Yeah, that's a good analogy. I thought. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Thank you. Yeah, on those border towns, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, if we're going to uh, agree with, to put our people in those jails, make sure they don't have a bunch of Judge Parkers over there in, in our border <laughs> towns, okay? Let's take care of our people. You got it. We would, but we'll always bring them back home. That's okay. the thing. They have there to come back go. here to face justice. There you go. Face your own people. All right. Good report. Now we have a motion and second. Is that right, Shelley? So all in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Good one. All right, last one. Councillor Austin, you're up. Yes, this is a resolution expressly encouraging incorporate tribal consultation and representation in the Boy Scouts of America program, and I'd like to put that in the form of a motion. Got a motion and second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Okay. I'd like to be added. Okay. Got EO, Mayor of Vian wants to be added. Yeah. Fast quest, speaker. Anybody else? Go ahead and add everybody to that, Shelly. Okay. Any announcements? To my right. Well, no one can be having any meetings, so we just cut all the funds there. Not unless you're Dora and you received your <laughs> stimulus. So anybody to the left here? I'm just all right. Need a motion to adjourn? <laughs> oh, wow. We're adjourned.